did I preach this before? And I was like, well, I've only preached here twice before, so if I preach it again, you know, they're going to think I'm a, I'm a one-note individual. I don't really have much to go on. But uh, you know what? I was just reading my Bible at work, and yeah, my job is very simple. Some people will be jealous of it. Some people wouldn't want to touch it with a 10-foot pole. Uh, I sit down all day and read. That's pretty much it. I just sit down and read. And it gives me a lot of time to study. It gives me a lot of time to read my Bible. Uh, every now and again, someone will come up, and I'll have to you know, do the whole screening process, ask them all those questions that, that you have to ask since the whole COVID thing started. But you know what? I, I, I'm blessed that I get to read and I get to study. And I, I was reading through Jeremiah, the book of Jeremiah. He's known as the weeping prophet. Uh, he, he, he laments quite a lot in this book. Uh, we'll be in a few passages. We'll be in Jeremiah 7, 30 through 32. Jeremiah 19, 3 through 6. Exodus 21, 22 through 25. And Ezekiel 18, 5 through 20. Uh, there will be a few references as well I'll probably make throughout uh, the other verses in Scripture. But those are going to be the main ones that we're going to focus on. And I was asked before the sermon started what the uh, title was. And I've never been very good with titles. So I, I would say that the title of this one you could say is either I never dreamt of it or I never thought of it. And I'm telling you, I, I, my dad read this verse to me first, uh, first time I remember really focusing on it years ago and it, it, I, 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 it's one of my favorite verses to go to on this subject it's one of my favorite verses to think of um, and it's very it's in a way it's a very just heartening verse because uh, uh, set of verses because of uh, the context behind it but another way um, it's true it's a very true verse it's very relevant relevant verse for our day and age and for what we live in today uh, yeah, I'm not, good. I'm not good with titles, so I would say that would be around the title. Uh, I'll start with Jeremiah uh, chapter 7, 30 through 32. If I can get to it decently quick. Put a little bookmark spacers, but I never was good with those either. I'm a very disorganized individual. That's never been a gift of mine. I'm not, I'm not an organized person. Here in Jeremiah chapter 7, uh, starting in verse 30, it says, For the Judeans have done what is evil in my sight. This is the Lord's declaration. They have set up their abhorrent things in the house that bears my name in order to defile it. They have built the high places of Tokyoth and ben Hinnom, whatever the valley, whatever, however you pronounce that, I'm not really certain myself. In order to burn their sons and daughters in the fire, a thing I did not command, I never entertained the thoughts. Therefore, look, the days are coming, the Lord's declaration, when this place will no longer be called Tophet and ben Hinnom of Ali, but slaughter valley. A thing I did not command, I never entertained the thought. Some versions say, I never thought of it. Never crossed my mind. At this time, during Jeremiah, there are a ton of false prophets who are speaking things that the Lord never spoke to them. That are telling the children of Israel, like, this is what the Lord has commanded. When the Lord never commanded a thing. So here he says, I never entertained the thought. Another thing in scripture I often use is, if it's repeated... If it's repeated, it's a very important lesson, one that you ought to look at, one that you ought to view, something that you ought to think about for a little bit. All right? If you mention, if you mention something more than once, it means he wants it on your mind more than once. And here over in Jeremiah 19, 
3 through 6, we read again. Because they have abandoned me and made this a foreign place. They have burned incense in it to other gods that they, their ancestors, and the kings of Judah have never known. And they have filled this place with the blood of the innocent. They have built high places to Baal on which to burn their children in the fire as burnt offerings to Baal, something I have never commanded, commanded or mentioned. I never entertained the thought. Like I said, when he mentions it more, when it is mentioned more than once, it's usually because it's literary advice they want you to think about it more than once. They want you to look at it more than once. They want you to think about it. They want you to look at this and see how immeasurable this is. They are burning their own children to Baal. They are burning their own children at altars to a false god. And the false prophets are telling them that is what Yahweh wants them to do. That is what the Lord Jehovah is wanting them to do. My goodness. Could you imagine that? Could you just sit there and think about that? Burning their own children to a false god. I'd like to say I couldn't, but we live in a day and age where that's the case. We live in a day and age where we don't even give our own children a second thought. And we all understand what this is. We're talking about abortion. We're talking about a day and age where we are killing our children en masse to a false god of self-pride and self-indulgence. I have never commanded or mentioned. I never entertained the thought. You know what's really bad about this? You know what's really terrible about this? I have heard people who claim to be reverends, who claim to be ministers of God, go to a, pu pu a pulpit and say that it's okay, that we should allow people to do this, that it's an honor thing. Matter of fact, it would be wrong if we didn't. I've heard, I've heard ministers who claim to be from God and of God say we should allow this. And it breaks my heart to think that there are people like that that would tell people this is okay. This is alright. There's nothing wrong with this. What you do to the least of these, you do to me. And how more or least can you get than someone who can't even defend themselves? Can't can't do anything to make sure they stay alive. Can't do it. Can't can't say a word. Can't you know? They can't even put their arms up and say no. You know nothing. But you do to the least of these. You do to me. I have with me here a book. It is the early Christian writings. It is a compilation of many early church writings between 90 to 115 AD. These are the, the post-apostolic church. These are the people after Paul, after Peter, after the apostles. Obviously, it doesn't hold as much weight as what we would read here in the Bible. This has final say. But you can gain a lot from reading these early works of Christianity. Because these are only one removed from the apostles. These are the people that the apostles taught. There are two books in particular that consider some of the earliest writings. One of them is called the Epistle of Barnabas. And the other is the, I've always pronounced it the Dedeck. But I've learned recently that it is not pronounced the Dedeck. It is pronounced the Dedeke. The E at the end. Is not silent, apparently has an A sound to it. It is the Didache. These are considered two of the earliest Christian writings in destruction. 
And in there, there's a little something called the two ways. I want to read a little bit from the decade what the two ways was. This is an early Christian teaching in the early church that we don't see much today, and there's truth to it. It's, it's not, I, of course, it's not as strong as it's not as strong as what's here, but you'll see and you'll hear some references in it that you'll say to yourself, I, I've read that. And it's because they're getting it from somewhere, and most of it is coming from this book right here. There are two ways. A way of life and a way of death. And the difference between these two ways is great. The way of life is this. Thou shalt love first the Lord thy creator, and secondly thy neighbor as thyself. And thou shalt do nothing to any man that thou wouldst not wish to be done to thyself. What you may learn from these words is to bless them that curse you, to pray for your enemies, and to fast for your persecutors. For where is the merit in loving only those who return your love? Even the heathens do as much as that. But if you love those who hate you, you will have nobody to be your enemy. Now you can recognize some of that. That is from the New Testament. Um, they didn't accept that. They didn't accept all the New Testament at that time as canon. They didn't come to do that till later on in history. But they had to hold a reverence for it. They held a, a deep respect for those writings of the apostles because they are the ones who taught them. It says here the way of darkness or the way of death, as it is also known. Uh, the the um, Epistle of Barnabas calls it the way of light and the way of darkness, whereas the uh, Didache calls it the way of life, the way of death. But it says here, the way of death is this. To begin with, it is evil and in every way fraught with damnation. In it, the murderers, adulteries, lust, fornications, theft, idolatries, witchcraft, sorceries, robberies, perjuries, hypocrisies, duplicities, deceit, pride, malice, self-will, avarice, foul language, jealousy, insolence, arrogance, and boastfulness. Here are those who persecute good men, hold truth in abhorrence, and love falsehood. Now why I'm referencing these two books right now with the way of the uh, two ways is they, sit, they tell us something very important about certain aspects of the early church and what the early church believed, what the early church taught in a very important uh, manner. Now, I'd like to read from both of them. In the Dedeke, it says, The second commandment in the teaching means commit no murder, adultery, sodomy, fornication, or theft. Practice no magic, sorcery, abortion, or infanticide. In the Epistle of Barnabas, it says, Never do away with an unborn child or destroy it after its birth. You know what's really important about that? You know, somebody might say, you know, if they said maybe half the word said, just don't do, uh, don't say, for instance, that they can only said abortion. People are like, oh, they're just talking about, you know, um, no, don't kill the baby after it's born or something like that. Don't do this or that. You know, they just translate it all. But no, they make it very clear there's two different methods they're talking about, abortion and infanticide. Matter of fact, before and after birth, do not do this. It was so important that it was mentioned in the Epistle of Barnabas and in the Didache. If you go to Ezekiel 21, or not Ezekiel, my bad. We go to Exodus 21, starting with verse 22, we read, When men get in a fight and hit a pregnant woman so that her child or children are born prematurely, but there is no injury, the one who hit her must be fined as the woman's husband demands from him, and he must pay according to, judi to, to judicial assessment. If there is an injury, then you must give life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, 
hand for hand, foot for foot, burn for burn, bruise for bru bruise, wound for wound. If there is an injury, you must give life for life. It is very clear in the Christian teachings throughout that before the child is even born, it is a lie. Now, obviously, not everybody who pushes the abortion agenda is going to be a Christian. This is for those Christians who try and push this agenda on other Christians, saying that God's all right with it, when it is very clear that he is not okay with the harming and killing of innocent life. It is very not okay. As a matter of fact, it's so un-okay. Un what the Bible says about killing the innocent, it's a curse makes you accursed. Shedding innocent blood is one of the most evil, corrupt things you could possibly do. In our sermon today, or not in our sermon, but in our Sunday school lesson today, we talked about how three men, three mighty men, went to go get David a glass of water. I mean, most likely it was a job. I'm going to say glass for our modern ears. A glass of water from the enemy's side, from a well from on the enemy's side, because David had just mentioned, oh man, you know, I wish I could get a drink of that water. And they came back with this water for David, and rather than drink it, David goes and says that my people have put their own blood on the line to get this water. And so I shall treat it as the Lord commands to treat blood, and as a sacred thing, I will offer it up to the Lord and he pours it out. We talked about how it would be funny to imagine how the men react, react to such things. We just risked our lives to get you that water. Now you just pouring it out on the ground. But I'm sure David mentioned to these people exactly why he was doing it. Told them why he was doing it. He said, don't worry that I did this because it's showing reverence to God. Because he risked your blood, I'm treating it as blood. And I'm showing reverence to God by pouring it out on the ground. Blood is considered a very sacred thing, as is our life blood. It is what gives us life. And the spill of innocent blood is a terrible and horrible thing for you to do. And over and over again, Scripture not only shows that he sees these children, that he has gifted with the gift of life as being alive before they are even born. So any Christian out there that tells you and says to you that, you know, it's okay. We ought to respect the rights of women to do what they want to do with their own bodies. We know very strongly that the Bible condemns such actions as evil and abhorrent. And we'll get back to that argument, my body, my choice, in a little bit. And there's a lot of arguments over you. And I know that everybody who brings them up, I'm going to say right here, this thing is, pulling on my head like there's nothing else. I'm just going to speak right here. I'm not going to do much moving right now. That thing is pulling like there's no tomorrow. So we're gonna always, we aren't always going to be able to use Scripture, are we? Because they don't accept it. If they don't accept it as authoritative like we do, it doesn't matter what Scripture says to them. It doesn't matter to them. So we got to express it in a different way, in a different way a lot of times. we got to look at it and say, well, you know, you don't accept the authoritative nature of Scripture, so I've got to express to you why this is wrong without it. And we can do that very easily. I don't think it's a very difficult case to make. I don't think it's a very difficult case to make at all to express why the child in the womb is a living life. I don't think it's a very difficult case to make at all. It's a very simple one. You'll hear a lot of counter-arguments. You'll hear a lot of people try and argue that because of their... I'm going to use some words that some people may find larger, some people may not. Because of their cognitive abilities, or their lack thereof, they are not considered on equal grounds as other human life. They are not considered human because they are not cognitively aware. Now, what does cognitive mean? Cognitive, ah, some people may find it bigger, some people might not. Cognitive 
means your self-awareness, your ability to ascertain information. You are aware of what you are and the things around you. It has to do with that mentality. So they're saying that because they are not as cognitively aware, they're not actually human life yet. They aren't aware. Well, that's like saying that one's, one's life and self-worth is based upon one's cognitive abilities. And I don't think that's quite right. And I don't think they quite feel that way either in, in any other case. Because when you look at it, special needs people are just as much people as anybody else. They're just as much people, and they're going to be loved and cared for just as anybody else, just because they're not as cognitively aware as another person. Doesn't mean they're not as special and as important as anyone else. And I believe many of them would be hard-pressed to argue otherwise. They also say, well, they aren't as self-efficient. They are completely reliant on the mother. Well, I know many people out there that are fully reliant on other people for in order to live. Are you going to say that those individuals aren't as important or as much of a person as somebody else simply because of their reliance on others to survive? My dad, for instance, takes care of a, 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 a girl. Uh, she was never thought to make it past the age of two or three, and here she is, 19 years old and still alive, but she cannot care for herself. She is paralyzed. She breathes through a tube in her neck. And she is just as important as anybody. She is just as much as a human being as anyone else, regardless of how well they can care for them or not care for them. I believe the definition of the human life is a very simple thing. And I believe science has proven it to be the case as well. For instance, what if we found life on Mars? Well, would it have to be a complex thing? No, it could be a one-cell organism and say, look, we found life on Mars. Well, why? What do they constitute as what life is? Well, they constitute it as something that has shown cellular, gro cellular growth and change. Well, doesn't a baby in the womb experience cellular growth and change? Then they'll say, well, does that mean that we have to show all life as, as something that is respectful? No, because we add on to the fact that this is a human life. Why? And how do you define this human? Let's say you find a fossil somewhere, and you go and you want to do some DNA testing on that fossil. And then you do some DNA testing on that fossil, and it comes up with human DNA. You know what the scientific community would classify that as? A human being. Does the child in the womb not have DNA? Does it not have human DNA? Would it not register under their, their perspective, under their scientific realm, as human? It'd be a growing human life. It'd be a, a life experiencing cellular growth and change with human DNA. Then some people will say, well, what about cancer? Then should we just treat cancer as a separate human being? You know, it kills people. Well, no. Because that cancer cell shares the same genetics as the person who, who, who it dwells in. Does the child in the womb share the same genetics as the individual it's in? No. Matter of fact, it shares completely separate genetic material from both parents. It shares from both of them, but it is unique. It is its own genetic life. So we see here several qualifications. One, it's life because it shows cellular growth. Two, it's human because it shares genetic material of a human being. Three, it's genetically separate from the mother. What does that mean? It is an independent human life. What else? It kind of holds the same potential as every other human out there to grow and mature, to grow older and mature. We have here an independent human life by every spectrum of the scientific field that you can look at that cannot be denied. This is, in fact, 
in human life that holds the same potential as everyone sitting in this room right now to grow and mature. There's no doubt about it. Scripturally looking, looking at it scripturally, we know that God has breathed life in these, in, into these children, into these embryos inside of the mother. We know that, it, that God has breathed life in them. Does that mean that, that they haven't been born and they breathe out? No, it means that they have the spirit in them. They have a spirit inside of them. No matter how simple or complex, it's there. So we have here an absolute definition that this is, in fact, an independent human life that shares the same potential as anybody else to grow and mature. And as an independent human life, we ought to judge it as such. We ought to look at it as it is and judge it proper, properly based on these many different nuances. So what does that say about my body, my choice? Well, it shows that it completely misses, completely misses the pro-life argument on what the child in the womb is. Because in their mind, they automatically assume it's not human life. But since the pro-life position, it, well, that it is, and I believe we have ample scientific evidence to support that statement, it's not their body. It's an independent body from them that shares inside of them, that shares their nutrients and grows inside of them. So is it their body, their choice? No, because it's not their body. It's another life entirely, another human life independent from themselves. So my body, my choice is not a good argument against pro-life position because the pro-life position argues that it's a human life inside of them, which would make it separate. Here's one you hear a lot. What if the mother was raped? What if the mother was raped? And this one really tugs on your heartstrings, doesn't it? Because who wants to think about that? That is such a horrible and terrible thing to think about. And to think that this person has to go through nine months of that reminder in their stomach. It really does tug at the heartstrings. And that's the whole purpose of it. But this is where... Now I'm going to use scripture. Ezekiel 18, 5 through 20 comes in. Now I'm using scripture because in it, it argues on a logical basis, on a reasoning that can be used independently from scriptural teaching. In other words, you don't have to have the scripture to teach this as rational. As something we can look at and say, no, actually, that makes sense. Here, in Ezekiel 18, 5 through 20, it says, Suppose a man is righteous and does what is just and right. He does not eat at the mountain shrine or look to, look to the idols of the house of Israel. He does not defile his neighbor's wife. Or approach a woman during her menstrual impurity. He does not oppress anyone, but returns his collateral to the debtor. He does not commit robbery, but gives his bread to the hungry and covers the naked with clothing. He doesn't lend money at an interest or for profit, but keeps his hands from injustice and carries out true justice between men. He follows my statutes and keeps my ordinances, acting faithfully. Such a person is righteous. He will certainly live. This is the declaration of the Lord. But suppose the man has a violent son who sheds blood and does any of these things, though the father has done none of them. Indeed, when the son eats at the mountain shrines and defiles his neighbor's wife, and when he oppresses the poor and needy, commits robbery, and does not return collateral, and when he looks to the idols, commits detestable acts, and lends at interest or for profit, will he live? He will not live, since he has committed 
all these detestable acts. He will certainly die. His death will be his own fault. Now suppose he has a son who sees all the sins his father has committed, and though he sees them, he does not do likewise. He does not eat at the mountain shrines or look to the idols of the house of Israel. He does not defile his neighbor's wife. He doesn't oppress anyone, hold collateral, or commit robbery. He gives his bread to the hungry and covers the naked with clothing. He keeps his hands from harming the poor, not taking interest or profit on a loan. He practices my ordinances and follows my statutes. Such a person will not die for his father's iniquity. He, cert he will certainly live. For if his as for his father, he will die for his own iniquity, because he practiced fraud, robbed his brother, and did among his people what was not good. But you may ask, why doesn't the son suffer punishment for the father's iniquity, since the father has done what is just and right, carefully observing all of my statutes? He will certainly live. Do not punish other people for the sins of their fathers. So why ought we to punish the unborn child who is fully and utterly innocent? Who has literally done no wrong and has not been alive long enough to do wrong for the sins of his father in the act of rape. Now you might say that why ought the woman to suffer another person's sin? But the woman does not hold the same claim as the infant in the womb. It's a terrible thing, a horrible thing I would not wish on anyone. But that child is still her child. It's still moral responsibility for that individual to hold and care and love for that being inside of them. And the being inside of them, the individual inside of them, should not suffer and be killed simply because his father sin. So what if the woman's rape is a terrible and horrible thing and us as Christians and us as people should show support to this person, should show love and concern to this poor person and show them that there's a way outside of death and murder. Here's a more difficult What if the mother's life is at risk? What if the doctors have said, listen, if you go through with this, not only will your baby die, but so will you. It's another horrible decision to be put up with. Like this is not only would you lose your child. And in this one, this is where that nuance comes in, where we judge the judge the baby as an independent life based on such things. We look at this and say, we, we know this is an independent life, and this woman may die. Now, some people may agree with me on this, some people may not, um, but it is a difficulty. Thomas Aquinas, I don't know if anyone knows who Thomas Aquinas is. He was considered a Christian philosopher, uh, 11 AD or so, 11, 11th century AD or so. Um, so 1100s, around, somewhere around 11, 1200. I can't remember right now exactly when. But Thomas Aquinas had a huge argument over this. <coughs> and he says this. Nothing hinders one act of having two effects only one of which is intended, while the other is beside the intention, which is per accidents. Now, moral acts take their species according to what is intended and not according to what is beside the intention. 
Usually when I read Thomas Aquinas, I have to read it about two or three times before I understand what he's trying to say. I, I own, uh, this. I'm, I'm pretty sure this comes from his, uh, um, apo- not his apology, his Summa Theologica, and I think it's the second book, which I actually own. I would not recommend many people get it, not because it's not a fantastic work, but you can read it for free online, and if you actually buy the book physically, it can cost upwards of $100. Um, I wouldn't recommend it. I, I found myself lucky with some extra money about it. But it is good, and it is very enjoyable. He's not always right. I don't always agree with him, but he does give a lot of good arguments, but I also find myself having to read him quite a few times because he can go whoosh, over my head very easily. He's arguing here that there usually can be two acts, the desired act and the non-desirable part of that, or the consequence of that act. And that God judges the hearts of man. That he knows the hearts of man, knows what our desires are, knows what we were desiring to do. And in that way, this one I tend to leave up for the judgment of God. Because it is very difficult. If the mother finds herself with the choice that they both may die, or they one may die, Thomas Aquinas will later argue that to save one life, is better than losing two lives. In this one instance, you can see where the mother's life is at hand that we ought to give that judgment up to God and say, Lord, I don't know. And this is fine. We don't always have to have answers for everything. But this is why this is such a nuanced thing. That I don't know. But here's what I will also argue. To always falter towards life. Because doctors can be wrong. They can be mistaken. They're not always correct. There are many times when they can get it right on the dock, and then there are many times when they can be completely and utterly wrong because here's the thing. Doctors as, are just as fallible or they are just as prone to making mistakes as any other human being. I am of the simple position that we ought to err into life. But if a mother's life is at risk, then we ought to show compassion and understanding and love as Christians to this person to let them know that even if it is a sin, that we serve a magnificent and glorious God who is quick to show mercy and slow in judgment. And understand that the desire was to save life and not to take life away. But that's the main difference between this and other arguments when it comes to abortion. This is the only argument that can be possibly made, and the idea of it is to save a life, not to take it away. And all the other ideas is simply to take away a life for your own selfish endeavors. As Christians, we ought to be willing to show these individuals love and concern and understand that we do not fight against individuals, but against principalities and the forces of darkness. We struggle against, we fight against the idea, the ideas being sent out by the world, not against the individuals themselves. Because the individuals themselves, we are about to have a heart towards their salvation and their coming to Christ. It's such a difficult thing. And I'll see, uh, my mother went to a protest at an abortion clinic, and she said on the one side, you had Christians who were loving and showing concern and saying there's other ways, there's other avenues that you can take. And on the other side, you saw hatred and anger and, and spitting, spitting venom. And a lot of these people are hurting. They don't know. They are confused. They are being lied to. They don't know any better. They aren't aware of other options. And as Christians, it is up to us 
to show them love and compassion and understanding, to let them know that we love and cherish them and that life is a beautiful, amazing thing to treasure regardless of the difficulties that may arise. That's something else they'll try and argue. And they'll say, well, what if, the, what if you put them up for adoption? If the adoption, if the adoption place isn't very good, what if they have a bad life? Well, I got news for you. We all have bad lives. We live in a sinful and corrupt world. Raise a hand if you've never had issues in your life. Exactly. All of us have had issues in our lives, some more than others, but we have all had issues in our life. They might have a bad life. They might have a good life. Mark Schultz was adopted, and he said that his mother getting up for adoption is probably one of the best things that ever happened to him because he was able to grow up in a loving and caring Home. So who are we to make this decision for these children before they were even born on how they tackle life and its difficulties? Rather, let us love them and put whatever money that might have gone towards performing abortions to helping them. To being there for them and as Christians going out and showing our support, letting them know that there are clinics out there that provide help and not just that. Because we all have bad lives. We are blessed and there are so many amazing things. You know, we live better than kings did back in the 15th century, 16th century. We have air conditioning. Oh my Lord, I don't know if I'd want to live without air conditioning. They didn't have air conditioning. If it was cold, it was cold. Maybe they hit a fire burning in a, in a chimney somewhere, but that was about it. When it was cold, it was cold. When it was hot, there wasn't even an option of fire. You maybe got little slits for some wind, hopefully, on that day, and there you go. If it was hot, it was hot. That's all you had going for you. I'm telling you, wow. We can go out right now. And go to a fast food restaurant and buy what we want to eat. Or we could go to a grocery store to get something that we want to eat. So yeah, there's different qualities of life. But it's up to us to decide what we do with what has been handed to us. With what's been given to us. It is not... We shouldn't just say, let's just kill anybody who may have a bad life. That is one of the most... disconnected, evil statements that anybody could ever make. Matter of fact, I would level it up to that of psychotic to say this person may have a bad life, so let's kill him. It is near psychotic. Another nuance. And I heard this argument a while back, and it's probably, honestly, what I think, it's probably one of the better arguments out there for abortion, but I feel like it holds the same problems that most dilemma questions have. How, how many of you out here know what a dilemma question, a moral dilemma question is? How many of you have heard of the trolley dilemma? start out with expressing this. The dolly dilemma is this. You have a dolly driver. You have some, or a trolley. I keep saying dolly. A trolley driver. The dollies are those little things you push around. A trolley is something that's on a track. It's on a railroad track. And if you look over and you say on this railroad track, you have a small child. On this railroad track, you have three people. And you have a decision to make. Do you pull the lever and kill the child, or do you keep going on and kill the three people? It's a moral dilemma. Which one would be more morally correct? Well, I got news for you. This dilemma holds some very big issues. You'll hear it a lot in philosophy classes. They'll, they'll bring it up. They'll say, here's a philosophy question for you. 
You know, which one's more morally correct? To kill the child or to pull the lever and, and end up uh, killing the three people? The moral wouldn't be placed on the person who's on the trolley, but the person who put the people on the railroad tracks to begin with. That's the person who would be morally responsible for the deaths of those individuals, not the person pushing the trolley. Or driving the trolley, rather. I keep getting dolly and trolley, I'm telling you. I'm telling you. This is the dilemma that, is brought, that was brought up by a professor in a college concerning abortion. They said, let us say you wake up one day, like you just were passed out and you wake up one day, and you are connected to this very popular, very beloved violinist that this, this group of people just love and adore the violinist. You are hooked up to them. They say that you are the only person that can keep this other person alive. And so they hook you up to a machine and tell you that since you are the only person that keeps this person alive, you have to be hooked up to this machine to them for nine months. Would you be held morally responsible for disconnecting yourself from that machine? That's a toughie, isn't it? That is a toughie, because on the one hand, you are forced into a position that you have no control over to be connected to this person. But on the other, on the other hand, there's a person whose life is at stake. There are a lot of questions to be had. First off, this is a very unlikely scenario. It's just a silly question to ask. Have you ever heard, the, ever heard someone say that there's no such thing as a stupid question? I disagree. There are lots of stupid questions. C.S. Lewis said a nonsensical, a stupid, a question that cannot be answered is a nonsensical question. It makes no sense. It is. There's no rationality behind it. When would there ever be a possibility where that is the case, where you're the only person, and no one comes up and asks you whether or not to be hooked up? It's not going to happen. They try to say, well, it happens with, with, with pregnancy. Well, no. It's not the same thing. One, this person is a stranger. I technically have no moral uh, responsibility to this person outside of... I have no direct moral responsibility for this person. The baby in the womb, the mother has a direct moral responsibility to this child. So there's that. There's a difference there. I have no direct moral responsibility to this person that I don't know and have never met. Two, the mother does have a moral responsibility to that child. Then you look at it here. You can't possibly know whether or not it's true that I am the only individual alive that can save this person's life of being hooked up to a machine. Where is your evidence that this is the case? Because I can give you evidence to express why it's the case that the mother is the only person alive that can give life to this person that can be there for this child. I can give you the case for that. It's very easy. But I cannot give you a case that is rash, something that we can rationally accept that says that the mother is the only, or that you are the only person that can keep this violinist alive. It seems like such a good argument to really start looking at it and seeing the huge differences for the moral aspect of this question, of this dilemma they give. You do not have a direct. Now, I'm using that. The reason I use direct is it's very important. There are indirect moral responsibilities that we may have. For instance, feeding the poor. This is something that we are commanded to do. But obviously, we cannot go out there and feed every last poor person who doesn't have a meal. It's just not going to happen. So are we morally responsible if a poor person starves to death? No. Are we morally responsible for giving care to the poor? Yes. This is what I would call an indirect moral responsibility versus a direct moral responsibility because my inaction does not necessarily mean that I have done what is morally wrong in the indirect, but my 
direct actions towards the child, which I have a direct moral responsibility to, does have a morally negative consequence to it. I have been morally wrong. So you look at here, you look at this example being given, and you realize it sounds so strong to begin with, but when you really start to dissect it and look at it, it's not. You have no direct moral responsibility as a person. You have no rational reason to believe that you are the only person that can keep this other person alive, alive when it comes to the womb of the child in the womb of a mother in which they do have a direct moral responsibility towards, and they do know whether or not they're the only person that can keep this person, other, other individual alive. They're just not the same thing. And at first, I know a lot of people have been tripped up by that, have looked at that and thought to themselves, I have no answer for that. But it has so many issues, just like the trolley experiment, or I say the moral responsibility would not fall on the driver of the trolley, but rather on the individual who laid the people on the tracks to begin with. And in the same method here, you look at it and you realize that there is a disconnect between the two situations that are being expressed here. The difference between a direct and indirect moral responsibility and the fact that you have no rational reason to believe that your action would cause necessarily an individual's death. You have no rational reason to believe that. But when it comes to this, you know what you're doing. And that goes back to this point by Thomas Aquinas about nothing hinders one act of having two effects. You disconnecting yourself from that person in this instance expresses that you are not directly intending to kill this individual. But when it comes to the child in the mother's womb, you are. That is the direct effect. That is exactly what you're looking for. I hope today that when we go out into the world and we, can, we go up and we see these arguments, that we have now become more prepared to tackle them and understand them better. I hope that we go out there with a heart burning to see these injustices gone, but to show love and care and concern for people who have had to go through this, who have had to be, who have been lied to and misled. And we show them a care and love and forgiveness of Christ as He has shown us. Just as we have been forgi forgiven our debt, we ought to forgive our debtors. We ought to forgive those around us. Show them this forgiveness and this love, this immeasurable love given through the sacrifice of Christ on the cross. Amen. To let them know that there is a Savior and that God is slow to judge and quick to, quick to mercy, to show mercy to you, to show love and care for you. We might have done this. But we serve a loving and forgiving God if we turn from our sins and follow him. Christ commands us to take up our cross and follow him. To deny ourselves and pick up the cross and follow him. Paul says we have died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? And we need to express to them this love and this understanding while also expressing to them the horribleness of these acts and how they are not desirable. That God, he never even thought of it. He never mentioned it. He never commanded it. It was so far removed from his mind, it wasn't even a thought. He never dreamed. Does this mean God didn't know this was going to happen? That God didn't know the children of Israel were going to do this? No. But that it is so far removed from desire of his that it never, that they 
express. He never even crossed his mind, never thought of it. Whew. You hear I said a lot to love the sinner and hate the sin. Not believe that through and through to love the sinner and hate the sin. And I am so glad that I serve a God who has given himself on a cross to die for a lost, horrible, and evil world so that they may know salvation and turn from their sin. Because we can't earn it. And this is a big thing here. Remember, they're all of Jeremiah, throughout all of it, what is the central message? That we cannot follow the law, that all of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. The children of Israel cannot follow it. And what was the purpose of the law except for, as Paul puts it, to make sin more sinful, to express to us how absolutely lost we are and incapable of doing good. And, our necess and the necessity we have for following after Christ and accepting his grace and forgiveness on the cross. We keep repeating the same mistakes over and over and over and over again. Just as the children of Israel burnt their children at the fire, so today we fill in the clinics. If you look at the history of mankind, it's one genocide after the next. One after the next. If that's not an expression of how much we need God, of how, what, that we need Christ, I don't know what is. And that we as the church need to share the gospel to a lost and a dying world because they need it. I needed it. And I am so grateful. Does that mean I don't sin anymore? Does that mean I don't make mistakes? Of course not. I make mistakes all the time. I know Brother Roger won't shut up about his about him making mistakes all the time. <laughs> <coughs> but we have Christ and his forgiveness, and we have that comfort and assurance in him. And I want the world to know. And we ought to want the world to know that Jesus saves. Yes, some music. Don't forget today, when you go out there, don't forget that this week, or this month, or this year, that we ought to show the loving kindness of God to these people while abhorring sin and understanding our own shortcomings so we can express to them how needed Christ is in this world.